Hello, hello, Mordimers here and welcome to the seventh round of Tata Steel 2021 and I would like to show you the game of the leader, Nils Grandelius, after six rounds was the leader. So Nils is number one uh, player in Sweden and in this game he's gonna to play as Black against Anish Giri. Anish Giri is number one uh, in Netherlands, however he is half Nepalese, half Russian, he was born in Russia, uh, he was raised in Japan, uh, he lives in Netherlands now and he has a Georgian wife. Just for your information if you are interested, in this game he is going to play as white as he didn't have a uh, other colors to choose. So we have e4, c5, it starts a very very interesting because uh, at the beginning we're gonna have the Nidorf. Nidorf in the Sicilian defense, famous or infamous Nidorf. And Nils Grandelius just a couple of days ago won against Maxim Vasil Lagraf, uh, who is the specialist of Nidorf. Uh, but Nils Grandelius played with the white pieces. Now he chose to play with the black pieces against Anish Giri. Now, why? It's a very interesting why. Anish Giri went for f3. So another variation, very sharp variation. Uh, I will just show you in a couple of moves uh, what is going on, why it's uh, sharp. Now, f3 move not only, you know, stabilize the center, central pawn e4, but also prepare g4, g5, and so on. The attack on the king side. So what is the idea? The idea is e5, then knight cannot go to b5. This is the idea of Nidorf to take under control the b5 square. So uh, knight b3 was played by Anish Giri. We have bishop e6, bishop e3, bishop e7, and queen d2 indicates that Anish want to go for the main line here. Uh, what is the main line? Main line, I will just show you, is castle. If black castle, then white can castle on the queen side. And now we're gonna have the race. I I made you, you made me. So uh, knight b to d7 is the main line. And then g4, like I told you, b5. Uh, white gonna attack on the king side, black gonna attack on the queen side. For example, g5, b4, so it's already very sharp. Uh, so knight e2, then knight e8, and then f4. And after that, a5, f5, attacking the bishop, but now black plays a4. So now white have a choice where this knight should be taken. Knight b to d4 is played uh, the most often. He takes on d4 and after knight d4. So we don't take the, the bishop here, but we play knight d4. Uh, then black have to know this move. b3, this is the main line. And then king b1. And it's completely crazy. b takes on c2 with the check. Knight goes back to c2 and now this bishop is trapped, but he gonna end on b3. And it was played plenty of times. We have at least, let me check, we have, uh, I think, 1,500 games start from this position. Knight a3 is played and so on, okay? 80% of the games ends with the draw, so it's very, very well known. And Sergei Karyakin played that, uh, Vichy Anand, Peter Leko, Peter Sfiedler, a lot of famous name so this is very well known however Niels Grandelius wanted to destroy this fan and he played h5 now it looks like pretty illogical or maybe logical because now white is not going to attack on the king side easily g4 it's gonna be met with the you know opening them the h file it's already is very very shaky so the main line Anish Giri knows that for the reason and I will sh tell you why just this interesting move h5 um, I see in the uh, public uh, database at least it was played for the first time in um, 1998 maybe it was played earlier uh, but Matthew Sadler grandmaster from Great Britain played it uh, for the first time uh, as of my knowledge at least uh, by the database uh, I will ask him on Twitter if maybe he will answer maybe not if answers I will drop it in the comments so you can check if you are interested 
but this is also well known. Now we have a couple of hundred games only compared to the you know more than 1000. Knight d5, this is what Anish Giri played. Um, knight takes on d5, e takes on d5, bishop f5, uh, and now bishop e2. That means white doesn't want to castle on the queen side, and of course we can understand that because this bishop stays on this diagonal, it's already very dangerous. The rook uh, or the queen can come also uh, to the semi-open c file, attack the position of the king, and at the same time white doesn't have the counter attack on the king side. Moreover, the king stays still behind these central pawns and can castle whenever it's risky. When it's not, then it still can stay in the center. So very, very tricky. Uh, here, Niels Granderius went for a5. So a4 is a serious threat. Where are you going to move the knight? This is why we have a4. And now castle. So what to play with the white pieces? Of course, you're not going to go for anything like c1. If you move this pawn, you can even imagine that this bishop, uh, together with the maybe some, some uh, sacrifice of the queen on a3, and followed by the bishop, if the, this pawn disappears, Appear. But you can imagine, you know, for example, the Boden mate and of course a lot of different uh, mates too risky. This is why Anish Giri goes for the castle on the on the king side. And now we have knight d7, f4, e takes on f4, bishop f4. And now I would like you to uh, contemplate a bit on this position. What is going on here? So first of all, what we see is the bishop is attacking h5. Also, the queen and the knight is watching at a5. Okay? This is important. For now, it's defended twice. This pawn is not defended. Also, there are some ideas like this bishop uh, can, for example, sacrifice on d6. Sometimes it could work, maybe in most uh, cases not. However, we're gonna have a discover attack on this bishop. So all of this already looks like very, very complicated. Now, the main line here, as very easy to... Uh, to imagine is the only one line and it's bishop g6 pretty logical we have 11 games in the database nine of them ended with the draw uh, one won by white one won by black now what is the idea of course defending the pawn on h5 and the pawn on a5 is still protected twice moreover uh, there are no discoveries on the f5 so this is perfectly fine and it was played plenty of times 11 uh, at least on the you know on the top level. Now Anish Giri in his course, he made the course on the chessable.com about um, this Nydorf variation, he introduced the move rook c8. Now rook c8 is a very tricky move because now this pawn is not, not defended twice so potentially the queen could go there for example but a black of course gonna have attack on c2 so that's the first thing. Of course white doesn't have even time to take the, take the pawn because that's gonna be you know just disaster. So this is why there is only one move. Uh, okay, knight d4 also could be played, but c3 is much stronger. And now knight f6, defending the pawn on h5. So everything looks uh, pretty good. Also, the knight is already pushing d5 pawn. So what to play with white? If Anish Giri make this course, that means maybe... Uh, I Actually, uh, Anish Giri joked that uh, Nils Grandelius probably bought uh, his course, but he was wondering it's on you know the written version with the lines or maybe all the video uh, if uh, it's only you know written version it's very very cheap so it's not the problem uh, if the the video version then it's more expensive but of course much more valuable so what if playing with the white pieces Anish Giri actually win this game that means um, that, you know, Nils Grandelius plays the, the opening, which is proposed by Anish Giri, and he is going, you know, if he's gonna lose, then he should get the refund to, for, for that, because what the heck is this? Uh, Anish, you promised me to win, and it's not work, so, um, you know, Anish was in the difficult situation, win that or not win that, try or not. Of course, I'm joking, uh, but here Anish Giri knows what, what he's doing. Now, first thing first, 
uh, it looks like very attractive to go for this bishop d6. The problem with this is that after bishop d6, uh, rook f5, yes, white is winning one pawn. However, after g6, where you're gonna move your rook, if your rook goes, for example, to f3, then this knight gonna gonna jump with the tempo here actually with two tempi here uh, so probably rook f2 f1 and then knight e4 attacking the queen now if the queen goes to e3 then the rook gonna come on this um open e file if queen d3 we gonna have rook e8 anyway and now if let's say knight d4 which looks like the most attractive uh because the knight can come for example to f3 also can jump somewhere um, to b5 and so on so very nice position for the knight the problem is queen h4 and now position of white is really really hard to defend now first of all uh, three pieces suddenly attacking the position uh, of the white king immediately so if you play something like knight f3 the problem is queen f4 and now okay rook a to e1 uh, g5 g4 how you gonna defend that okay you can you can try to kick the queen but then knight g3 winning the pawn uh you have to move the the rook the knight going back and it's still you know g4 it's still uh in the air attacking the knight uh so so position is extremely extremely uh sharp Queen h3 would have to pr probably be played, and after exchanging, white would have these two ugly pawns. A bishop c5, moreover, is coming. This knight is the defender of the bishop, and now it's pinned. So this is very, very unpleasant position. Also, the knight can jump, for example, to, to d2, uh, for example, to attack this knight, uh, attack the rook, and so on. Very, very active uh, position for, for black. Black would probably win the game. So it's not worth to win this pawn because um, defending is, is definitely in this position is not fun. So this is why we have bishop e3. Uh, Anish Giri knows all of that theory very, very well. We have bishop e3. E4, Nils Grandelius also knows that. And now uh, this pawn is attacked twice. Anish could defend it, but he decided that bishop d4 is much stronger. Now, what is the idea? We have knight d5 by Nils Grandelius, and now bishop f3. And now, uh, what is the idea? Because Anish Giri just lost one pawn. Uh, the idea is that this pawn which was attacked now it's not attacked by the queen because the pawn uh, moved to c3 so this idea was pretty awesome however the queen gonna find the way to attack and this pawn again how uh here in this position there are two options so bishop f3 could be played and now um, after rook f3 and let's say bishop g5 a queen e2 can be played and then the queen can come to b5 and attack the pawn together with the attack on the uh, on the knight so probably something like knight e7 just to defend but of course after queen b5 and knight c6 we're gonna have this position so this way or another white gonna win the pawn this or another pawn now the idea is that white gonna have uh, three pawns against two pawns uh, of black and these pawns are completely not coordinated so this is the idea uh, on the other hand black have the three pawns against two pawns on the king side however there are the kings over there so it's you know it's very difficult to make the past pawn which is not blocked by the king so this is the very simple logic uh, we have bishop g5 however so Nils grandelius first attack the queen a uh, queen has to be moved so we have queen e2 of course uh, coming maybe to b5 uh, but first we have bishop f3 asking okay are you sure you want to go with the queen over there and anish giri played absolutely the best move in the position Queen f3, he knows this opening really well. Now, not only the knight is attacked, but also h5. And it looks like, okay, now we can defend. This is what Nils Grandelius played. But now queen f5 attacking this bishop. 
What a beautiful continuation. And now, as you see, this pawn is attacked. This way or another, it's always gonna be attacked in all variations. So this is why this course is a really, really great. But so far, from what I see, is um, it's really great for, for white, at least for the plan. The engine doesn't show that, okay, this is, you know, winning for white or something, but white really have the, the really tough answer. So I'm wondering if Nils Grandelius just wanted to test um, Anish Giri. He was sure that Anish will go for that, uh, as he can do a little bit of marketing here. Uh, here we have knight g4 defending the, the bishop and of course this pawn is taken. So for now uh, Anish Giri gonna have uh, three pawns against these two pawns which of course are not coordinated at all. And now exchange the queen or not, if the queen are exchanged then of course the knight would come with the tempo here. So first better of course to move the rook to the, to the open e file. Uh, we have queen d8, we have bishop d8, we have rook f to e1. Now asking to exchange the rooks, uh, but we have knight e5, centralizing the knight, saying, okay, if you want, you can exchange, I'm gonna fix my pawn structure, and I'm gonna have four pawns against your two pawns, so, uh, okay, you have you have three pawns against one, but my four pawns in the center probably gonna be stronger. Uh, so we have knight d2, Anish Giri is not interested in that, we have rook e6, we have rook e to d1, and now this is the critical moment of the game, Game, Anish Giri said in the interview that what black should play in this um, in this case is something like knight d3 or h4 or probably both of them. So the plan could be as follow. Let's say h4, maybe h3 would be annoying, so h3 knight d3 now and now this knight can be pretty much annoying. First it attacked the pawn and now if white want to defend that pawn the problem is knight f4 knight f4 uh, and now black would like to exchange this bishop um, so pretty much this bishop would like to go somewhere but there are no good squares here bishop f2 we're gonna have rook g6 and attacking the, the g2 pawn which cannot be defended so this is one of the ways b4 it looks like pretty logical but now again we're gonna have knight f4 the same stuff here if white doesn't care we're gonna have of course knight e2 king f1 and uh, white not gonna have so beautiful three pawns Yes, there are two pawns, so some passed pawn uh, probably gonna be created here. However, at, at the same time, black get a lot of activity on the on the open C file, so the rook can come and it can be very, very also unpleasant for, for white to play. So all of this sudden, you know, it's uh, black gonna get a lot of counterplay. From the other hand, if you play king f1 and you want to cover and um, the e2, the problem is you cover nothing because, you know, your pawn is still under attack. So so you actually achieve nothing. So this could be could be very very interesting maneuver. However, Nils Grandelius was very low on time and he played king f8. Anish Giri said this move just completely does nothing. Black just lost one tempo uh, for nothing. So now he immediately goes for the b4 uh, and only now we have knight c6 harassing the bishop. Bishop f2. Now we have knight e5 also following this way or another after and after the bishop, uh, but already white gonna make another move with the pawn. Uh, and here we have um, another moment where Nils Grandelius actually is maybe no, maybe in the in the in the very difficult position, but he could win the pawn a different way than he did. He got you know rook c3 immediately. What he could do is knight g4. The difference is that okay, White doesn't want to you know exchange this bishop, so probably something like bishop d4. Uh, but then knight e3 attacking the rook. So you want to exchange or not? If not, uh, then we're gonna have knight f5 again harassing the bishop. If bishop f2, then finally this bishop gonna be alive, uh, pinning the knight. So now the rook has to go to d1 to defend, otherwise if the knight is moved then of course white gonna lose the exchange. Uh, but now bishop f6 and now going on this diagonal, which is pretty much very important. So for example b5, now bishop c3 with the attack on the rook, rook a to c1, uh, and now for example knight d4. And this is extremely complicated game, uh, but I would like to just tell you that this knight is attacking the 
the pawn also there are some some tricks here some forks so probably finally white would be forced to uh to go for that and um, pretty much everything is fine rook a8 and now how to defend this pawn uh, you can do it with the knight c4 but it's not gonna be so comfortable to play and um, because of this bishop covering a1 so this was the way to go the last moment where nils grandelius probably could hold it however he went immediately for rook c3 now we have b5 anish giri just goes straight forward now we have knight g4 but it's too late bishop d4 now this rook has to move somewhere so it's a losing tempo uh this bishop uh, will never come to the to the f6 uh, first the rook has to be moved so rook d3 and now knight c4 uh, making another difficult decision what to play next if we have rook d1 then of course we're gonna have rook d1 and what next d5 knight b6 uh, you have to bring the knight to the defense maybe maybe knight f6 uh, and then after rook a1 white gonna have very strong attack here so for example if black play something like king e8 and want to bring the bring the king uh, then it's just too slow because now a6 is the move it looked like black of course can win the the, the piece however after taking attacking uh, and winning the piece this pawn uh gonna promote to the queen and win the game so that's not the best idea probably bishop b6 would have to be played but after bishop b6 what next uh knight d7 attacking the bishop no problem bishop c7 everything is fine and black doesn't really have a good moves if uh, trying to push also make some counter play in the center play d4 then we're gonna have of course a6 b takes on a6 b takes on a6 and now rook e8 because have to stop this pawn which is not possible because first uh white actually can deliver the check so kick the uh king to the to the g8 square and then play rook b1 and you already see what is going on here rook a8 uh, can be met with the rook b7 saying okay we can exchange the pawn for your knight so i'm gonna win the game probably knight f6 but now we're gonna have rook b8 of course completely winning uh, all of this is forced there are some moves like knight d5 and can you know go to b6 but of course it's completely lost uh because after bishop c7 it's gonna win uh, um, this knight and and yeah d3 doesn't work of course because first bishop b uh, b6 d2 and white gonna be first with the queen uh, and gonna win this pawn and the game so rook d1 doesn't really work nils grandelius tried something else rook d4 and now rook d4 we have of course rook d4 so what is the idea bishop f6 making uh, this beautiful skewer rook d2 d1 and now this is another moment where Nils Grandelius with the minutes on the clock have to calculate extremely complicated variations. It's probably lost to him. Uh, it's very difficult to hold that. Even he has one extra pawn, but it's not enough. So, for example, I will show you the variations, possible variation. Bishop a1, the, the most obvious. What would happen? Rook e1, let's say d5, knight b6. Uh, maybe rook e7 knight c8 attack the rook rook c7 knight d6 and now the point is that this knight can be sacrificed for the pawn believe me or not but after king um, e7 white is winning this way and after a6 it's not possible to stop these pawns uh, you should know that two pawns supported by the rook cannot be stopped by the single rook so this is the problem that white gonna promote to the queen and the win the game so bishop a1 doesn't work what else knight e3 looks the most promising and now it's very tricky because if white goes i uh, want to avoid the exchange of course knight b6 looks very very attractive uh, then the problem is knight d1 and after rook d1 bishop d8 uh, how you gonna continue the knight can go to c4 maybe uh, but then bishop c7 uh, defending the pawn why not why to lose the pawn and and then we would have still very very complicated end game where black have one extra pawn and probably would maybe try to fight for the win very very complicated but there is no clean way of winning um on the queen side so this is one of the way so this is why in this position anish would be forced to exchange the knights um, and then 
after bishop a1 if Anish decide to exchange everything we would have the the rook endgame a6 b takes on a6 b takes on a6 uh, rook e8 and we would have something like this uh, and that also probably would be a draw uh, the king would be forced to move pr probably to b7 once this pawn is taken white probably would take some other pawn um, and that would be probably a draw three pawns against two pawns um, that's the, the the most possible variation what would happen here uh, however white also could try to fight for the win with the knight d5 avoiding to exchange the minor pieces and then black could go for the bishop f6 but also very tricky bishop b2 and now what is the idea after a6 b takes on a6 b takes on a6 bishop a3 so of course a7 is not possible because of the bishop c5 uh, winning that pawn uh, so probably much more precise would be king f1 first but then after bishop a3 white would have a6 b takes on a6 and now not taking but moving forward and this is very very tricky because now after bishop c5 b7 rook e8 and now white is winning um confidently knight c7 where you're gonna move the the rook if rook b8 first we're gonna have rook b1 and then the knight gonna jump to the to the a6 attack the rook um, and win the piece and if for example rook d8 then we're gonna have knight a6 with the similar effect um so for example b bishop a7 rook c1 now very interesting of course winning uh, on the spot if rook d7 uh, then simply promote to the queen and with the knight for the two pawns white probably would win that uh, but of course black can try to fight for the win as well so it seems like knight e3 would be the the most promising continuation but we have d5 by Niels Grandelius asking to maybe take the pawn but of course uh, Anish Giri is not interested that the rook has to keep an eye on the rook on a1 so this is why we have knight b6 and now the last chance for Nils Grandelius to maybe hold but probably also not not because if he just get the, the exchange back then what to play next if he plays something like d4 then he is lost after a6 b takes on a6 b takes on a6 rook e8 we know that already a7 and after let's say d3 because what else you can play if the the knight controls the, the square there uh then of course you're gonna lose the game as well rook a8 uh, and now rook comes with the with the check uh, knight c4 gonna stop this pawn and that's all end of the dream white gonna have extra rook uh, also i was thinking okay maybe rook b6 here uh but the knight would be too slow the knight have to uh, appear on d6 uh, just to defend the problem is uh, to get there the knight need three moves and white gonna get this pawn in two moves so uh, it's just too slow knight e3 and of course the knight not gonna be on time uh, white gonna win the game so that would not work uh, all of these variations would not work uh, so this is why Niels Grandelius went for knight e3 so he plays the same variations just one move later which is already too late and here you can pause the video and find the winning continuation for Anish Giri while I enjoy my cup of tea okay ready there is only one winning move only one winning move Anish Giri found it immediately and he played knight d7 and after king e7 knight f6 Niels Grandelius resign now why did he resign uh, there are two options for for Niels if he takes on um, d1 then of course we're gonna have knight d5 with the check so that's the problem king d6 and then the rook gonna take and um, white gonna have extra extra knight uh for example check and the knight you know extra knight is is winning here this pawn's of course gonna promote so uh, no chance this way and if he takes the knight immediately uh then this rook can just move wherever for example b1 uh, rook e8 and after a6 uh, of course if everything is exchanged then we're gonna have the rook first on b7 then on uh, b8 and it's gonna win the game as well so probably something like rook a8 but it's still um losing for black a takes on b7 and now uh rook b8 
b6 for example and now if black decide to take the pawn then of course we have very easy rook a7 and then we're gonna push the pawn uh, play rook a8 and win the game uh but if knight c4 this can be a bit tricky but it's still uh winning for white because now rook a8 first and after rook b7 rook a7 uh rook b6 wins the game why because rook b6 with the check and now winning the knight at the end and the game so this is why after knight f6 Niels Grandelius resigned so that was advertising for the course of Anish Giri uh, on Chessable you can check this this course on Chessable you can also check the link in the description I'm gonna put it here down there uh, I'm not sure if Anish Giri is going to uh, refund to Niels Grandelius that he lost the game um, but they discuss later all the lines so maybe Anish will you know improve his course M maybe gonna make you know um, some extra material for for the people who bought who knows and um, anyhow and i would like to show you also uh, the standings after seven rounds anish giri who won this game also jordan van forest won the game and they have four and a half points together with fabiano caruana the winner uh, of the last edition one year ago um, and also with the alireza firuzia who won against jan krzysztof duda also that was a thriller another thriller uh, we have also uh, pantala hare krishna andrei yesipenko magnus carlsen and nils grandelius with the four points so eight players get you know very very close it's very crowdy on the top uh, Radosław Wojtaszek has uh, three points out of seven and the rest of the players have two and a half two and a half and uh, Alexander Donchenko who just was the replacement of Daniel Dubov uh, has two points uh, he couldn't just prepare if you like this video as always press like if for some reason you don't like it press on like and if you don't want to miss other games on Tata Steel 2021 press subscribe smash the bell button thanks for watching and See you in the next one.